Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast for November 10th, 2021. We are sitting down in studio, as you see, the big uh, wall of political memorabilia behind him. The new leader of the Alberta Party of Alberta, but I guess I can just say Alberta Party, but the new leader of the Alberta Party, Barry Morishita. Barry, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. So, Barry, um, if uh, you said you've listened to the show, so you know my first question is going to be, where does your sense of duty to serve come from? That's a really, that is always a great question. And I, you know, it always, you know, every politician says that's a really great question just to give himself a minute to answer. So my duty to serve, uh, born at an, or was born at an early age. So I, interesting story. So I grew up in a very small town, uh, Rosemary, Alberta, population 300 or so. Um, and we got a, a social studies teacher. I was 14, got a social studies teacher who landed from Simon Fraser University, his first teaching job. Uh, you know, so coming from SFU to Rosemary, Alberta. And uh, he just instilled a love of politics and the possibilities of it. And so from that moment on, I, I just seemed to catch up. I, I was involved in the students' union and I, I did organized things and then uh, coached hockey. I loved doing that and got married and started having a family. And when I moved back into Brooks, I started joining volunteer groups. I started sitting on boards and commissions and just grew from there. Parents political? No, not overly. <laughs> um, always talked about it, but you know, they weren't active. You know, we always had some great, great discussions, uh, but um, not overly active. Um, and there was always a very, very divisive conversation a lot of times because I'm half Japanese. And so my dad was actually born in an internment camp in Tashmi, BC, which is just outside of Hope. Yeah, so imagine one generation from me, my dad, um, born in 1945, and his, and his sister as well, born in 1946, in the camp in Tashmi. So my grandmother was born Canadian, born in Canada. Uh, Canadian. She was always very bitter about that, and so there was always a kind of a liberal conservative thing because Mackenzie King was the prime minister when this all happened, and she vowed she would never vote liberal because of it, and she never did that I know of. <laughs> and so there was always, you know, there's always political overtones on every conversation. So it's I've grown up with it pretty, pretty naturally. Um, you, as we are recording this, you are one day in retirement of being mayor of Brooks. Um, you were, you swore in your daughter, yes. you swore in the, the new council for Brooks. Um, but going from municipal politics to party politics, because you are now the leader of a provincial party is a big decision. What was the decision based on to jump into the provincial uh, world of politics? Uh, so uh, about a year ago, roughly October of last year, I, uh, I knew that kind of my time was going to be coming to an end at AUMA, Alberta Urban Municipality Association. I've been the president there for four years, and uh, there's just some great leadership waiting in the wings there, and I, I was really lucky to serve with a lot of them. And, you know, it was time, um, time to, to move on there. And I was pretty sure at the time that municipal politics alone wasn't going to keep me occupied. And again, it was time. I was 16 of the last 22 years I've been on council, and the last nearly seven as mayor. And so there were people that were, were ready to step up and provide new perspectives, which I think is healthy. And Brooks is in great shape right now. And uh, it started with a conversation with a friend of mine, Mr. Doug Griffiths, who I was trying to persuade to run for the, <laughs> the Alberta Party. <laughs> and so we had, uh, we had regular conversations. Um, promised to talk to each other kind of once a month regularly and... And then uh, about a couple meetings go by, and he said that I should consider doing it. And I really considered it at the time. I thought Doug would be such a perfect fit. So I did. And then for the next couple of months, I phoned a lot of people, a lot of people I knew really well. I talked to some people that I didn't know well. Um, I asked them what they thought of politics in Alberta. I tried to get, you know, I, I really pride myself on trying to have a good perspective before I make decisions. So that took a few months. And... You know, early in the spring, uh, I decided that this is maybe the way I'm going to go. And then, for me, it has to feel right. Uh, I've, I've run once when I didn't quite feel right about it, and I lost, and my heart wasn't in it. It turned out really well overall, but, you know, you always have to have a good purpose. And uh, as the kind of summer moved along, 
um, one of the conversations I had with my kids. Now, COVID's been hard on everybody, and uh, but Alberta seemed to have a heaviness in it, kind of a weight on everybody. And my children, who I'm really lucky, one lives in Brooks, as you said, was I got to swear her in as the youngest uh, on my new council in my community and only woman. And my other daughter, who's an actor here in Calgary, uh, they weren't, you know, I think they, they were talking about not living in Alberta. And I'm born and raised, my kids are born and raised, and that was troubling for me. And it wasn't a specific thing, it wasn't the economy or COVID, but it was everything. Uh, the combat, the conflict, and, uh, and then the curriculum came out, and my granddaughter's five, and I read the entire grade one curriculum. Oh. <laughs> uh, just, you know, because I kept hearing this, but, you know, you want to make, you want to be informed before you beak off. And I can't imagine a six-year-old learning that curriculum and coming away from grade one saying, man, I'm excited to go to grade two. <laughs> and so uh, just all of those things, um, lack of consultation with me as AUMA president, you know, we, we thought we could get off to a good start, but the government ignored us on the Local Authority Elections Act, on the spend on the um, donation limits and then the RCM it just continued that there was a lack of consideration for what people were feeling in Alberta and so here I am so why the Alberta party because I think that's the first question a lot of people would ask you why should I look at the Alberta party so in your words why did you look at the Alberta party because there are other parties out there yeah. uh, that's a uh, you know it was a discernment I had so I Full disclosure, I've been asked by other parties to run. And uh, at the end of the day, I I just, I, I've never made decisions like that, where you already have a solution and you're kind of boxed in. And that's the ideological, like really the hard ideological. I've been to conferences, observed them. And, uh, you know, I had earlier in my career, I'd been part of the provincial um, liberals when Lawrence Decor was uh, and it was a renewal then, and that's what attracted me. But at the end, the Alberta Party, to me, uh, doesn't come from a single perspective. It, it's a collaborative decision-making process, much like municipal governments are, and I'm, I'm really comfortable there. And I think uh, most Albertans like that kind of decision-making. We don't very often come to the party with a pre, uh, predetermined solution. Uh, we typically get together with our friends, if, and it doesn't matter if we're kind of moving, house moving or whatever, we don't say we're only doing it this way and you scrap on the front yard and no one gets moved. We actually, hey, we're going to get this piano through this way and you kind of work it out and then you get that piano at the door. And that's what Albertans want. They, they want progress. And so the Alberta party, the way uh, they're built, makes a, really, makes a really good fit for me. We are in a interesting time when it comes to provincial politics. We have a premier um, who is unpopular. There are some decisions that he's made, even within his party, he is unpopular. We have a leader of the opposition who was the former premier, and people are having a hard time trusting them because of what they were doing in four, their four years as, in office. When you're going across this province, and you just talked about where you're going in our pre-interview, when you're going across this province and talking to uh, Albertans, what are they telling you about provincial politics, about the two parties that are currently sitting in the legislature? You know, I think the most uh, kind of uh, message that's resonating when, I, when I'm with people uh, across this province, and I've toured the province for the last four years every summer, so uh, two years with... Uh, with uh, Rachel Notley as Premier and, and the last two with uh, Mr. Kenny. And they just feel left out, not part of the process. You know, a lot of uh, conversations and statements made, but when the rubber hits the road on the decision, no one really thought about how it affected people. And one of the things that I think is really important and that we, we should always try to do that, it doesn't matter what level of government or how you're making a decision, if you have a a decision to make and, and everybody faces challenges, boards, commissions, municipal councils, all of this. At the end of the day, you know, you kind of figure it all out, but at the end you should still ask, you know, how is this going to affect individual people? And if your policy leaves people behind or hurts them, then it's not right. And I think there's a lot of policy that's happened in the last four years in Alberta that even started out and mostly starts out well-meaning, you know, they're trying to solve a problem. 
uh, but they don't get down to who we are here for, and that's to make sure people are lifted up and uh, and get the chance to be successful. So those who have listened to the show before know that I don't come in with notes because I want this to be an open conversation. I want you to lead the the, the guest to lead the conversation. I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up with that statement you just said. What policies? So you, you said there's multiple policies. So name yeah. one. Name okay. one that you you believe was good intentioned, but has turned out that people are being left behind because of it. Well, with the NDP, I think the farm bill was a really good example of a of a well meaning. You know that there was a, there was some issues they were trying to address, but at the end of the day, they didn't go talk to the people that were be most affected by it. You know, they had a preconceived notion about what the problem was, and they had a preconceived notion about who they were imposing the legislation on. And um, my, my brother's a farmer and rancher north of me in Brooks, and he didn't have, you know, we had lots of discussions about it. He, didn't, he understood the general, you know, people should be looked after, there should be safeties and things for workers. But they made it impractical to follow on a farm, on a family farm, on a place there's a culture and there's an issue and there's a whole bunch of things that you have to consider. So the farm bill was a really good one. Um, and you know, you could go uh, here, you can talk about uh, the Local Authority Elections Act, which was supposed to do, um, you know, bring transparency and, and increase democracy. And, and all it did was actually introduce partisanship and potential uh, third party advertising that's not. You know, so those, those recommendations weren't considered. Even the survey was completely ignored. And so when you consistently do that, then you do alienate people. People lose their trust for their government when overwhelmingly you said, hey, well, this is how we'd like it to go. And it, when it goes the opposite way, uh, I think that's, you, you continually see it. Um, the curriculum is a good indication as well. The, the dispute with doctors, and particularly in rural areas, where doctor recruitment and retention is a major issue for quality of life to keep communities together. And no one, I know no one came to Brooks and said to the city of Brooks or the county of Newell, who are good neighbors around us, and said, hey, what's going to happen if we do this with doctors? We know everybody understood we had to contain costs and we, you know, we had to all work together to, to, to deal with the economic situation. I don't know anybody who wasn't willing to help there. I really don't. But when they impose those kinds of uh, policies that damaged our quality of life and our community, then of course you got the uproar. All they had to do was come and see us and listen to us, and we could have told them what was going to happen, but they never did. So before we start talking about some actual uh, policies that you might be putting forward as leader of the Alberta Party, I want to, uh, I want to ask the, the question that everyone is probably going to yell at me if I don't ask. You are a party with no seats in the legislature. You are, you, you have been le permanent leaderless until August of this year when you took on that role after, uh, after uh, the former interim leader, Jackie Frensky, uh, took that role on for a year and a half. What do you need to do as the leader of the Alberta Party to connect with voters? Because we are in a pandemic, it is hard to do traditional politics as normal. You do not get a voice in the legislature, so... Uh, the ledge reporters are not going to be calling you up and saying, hey, let's talk about this legis piece of legislation. So what do you need to do to make sure you, the Alberta Party's voice is heard? You know, we're, we talked a lot about this uh, at the beginning when, you know, we were, weren't sure whether we're going to have a leadership campaign or not. But, you know, we're going to, for lack of a better word, we're going to hyper-localize our campaign. Um, the fact is, is that everything in this province is built from a community up. Small communities, large communities, but communities. There's communities of people and communities of place, but there's also community of profession and industry and all of those things. They all work together to build Alberta. And one of the things that, again, hasn't been happening enough is that good conversation. And by conversation to start with, politicians need to listen first and hear those issues. And then ask for solutions. I always, all my meetings that I have with anybody, I always, we talk about challenges, we talk about issues, but I always ask for what solution you have. Like, how could you help? Because the fact is, we're not going to pull Alberta out of this economic issue and our current political strife, the conflict. 
without all of us stepping forward. So that's how we're going to do it. I wish I had more than 20 months to do it. Honestly, it would be nice to have more than 20 months, but that's what we have. So I'm just going to go uh, and um, I'm counting on people I meet to meet more people. And we're counting on collecting great candidates who speak to community and speak to solutions that are practical. And, uh, you know, we're just going to work hard and be honest, straightforward and, and, and just go hard. That's what we're going to have to do. I appreciate that because often communities get left behind, right? I, as a former uh, a city administrator, uh, city employee, I know that it is hard for uh, city town councils to talk to politicians at the provincial level because it's usually imposed on that. So when you have someone like yourself who has that municipal experience, you know what municipalities are looking for. So communities is first. I want to talk about policy now because this is this is the fun part for me because I like to hear what how, how you would do things differently but also where we need to go. And let's talk about the big elephant in the room and that is COVID-19. Yep. Um, we are in the fourth wave right now. Uh, you've been uh, double vaxxed, I'm assuming. Yes, I have been. I have as, as well. Um, when he came to the door, he was masked. He we're socially distanced doing this interview right now as always. I got to ask the question what is what in, in your opinion how has this government handled covid-19 so inconsistently would be my, <laughs> my easiest way to put it and that and that is and that is uh, i can't put myself in this government's place in terms of how and when they made decisions and that is part of the problem so i can tell you that how we how we would do it different how i would do it different so when we had a large outbreak in brooks uh, May of last year, where we were double the concentration uh, per 100,000 of any place in North America. You know, we took direct action, but there were two things primarily. We didn't have vaccination protection then. We, we didn't have any of that. Uh, but and, and I have to give uh, Premier Kenny kudos here. He helped us get that drive-through testing site. So at the time, all we had was testing. And at the time, we were testing 1%. Uh, but asymptomatically, once we did, we 3,500 people, we set up this clinic, uh, drive-through test site, we were testing 10%, so we knew we had a big problem on our hands. But we, we, I would just have attacked the problem more directly. So we had outbreaks. Um, the problem is, a lot of municipal leaders and didn't know where the outbreaks were, because AHS, uh, I, I critically, in public health um, and on local level, weren't sharing information the way they should. The fact is no one knows our communities better than local councils, local school boards. We know our community well. And it was like pulling teeth to get specific information out of them. We have a very diverse community. Uh, you know, we're in Northeast Calgary right now. You were subject to a lot of big outbreaks and concentrations. And, you know, to get the specific information was difficult. So how do you do it differently? So you do have to be consistent. So you have to show kind of what your end goal is, I think. And we all know the end of COVID, but I think that was even the wrong end goal. The right goal should have been to keep people safe. What can we do differently moving forward? Because we are still, people are still hesitant about getting the vaccine. Where we're at that like 70% mark, if a little bit lower, a little bit higher. People don't want to get the vaccine. We are still seeing uh, hospitals being overrun by patients and people like myself are waiting for surgeries, are waiting for important surgeries that could be life and death. And how do we move forward in a time where po politics has been so divisive and the issue around COVID-19 has become so, you're either against it or for it, it seems like. How do we move forward in this time? Well, I think, I think we have to get together. Um, <laughs> you know, it's unfortunate that even in a global pandemic, politically, we can't, our leadership can't work together to solve this, which is, you know, it, it goes against community building. And even if you are the premier of the province with four and a half million people, like I said earlier, we are all a bunch of communities woven together. And if we can't look to our leadership to work together, how can we ever expect people to do the same thing? And so, you know, I think to move forward, we have to change the way we do politics. Um, and it, it's, it seems it, it's easy to say, but it's very difficult to do. You have to let go of preconceived notions about winning and losing. The fact is our goal should be to make Alberta a better place for every man, woman, and child. And if that means that 
you know, the NDP have a good idea or the UCP have a good idea or during a pandemic that we actually work together to message to Albertans what, what we need to do what, and be transparent and open and honest and, and lay it all out on the card, on the table and let Albertans choose. I think we would have been way better off. So I think that's primarily what we have to do. People need to trust their leaders. They need to know they're getting all the straight goods and that they're doing it for the right reason. And I just, I don't think there's been a lot of that going on, not just in Alberta, but Canada, North America, for the last several years, where it seems uh, the game of politics is the only game we play, which is the win-lose, uh, zero-sum for, for elections or issues. And the fact is, is that we should be looking across the uh, across the street. How did my neighbor do with my decision? And there's just not been enough of that going on. We are always releasing new episodes and from time to time, new specials of the Cross Border Interview podcast. Be sure to hit the subscribe button wherever you are getting your favorite podcast so you never miss an episode. But also, be sure to head over to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and give us a follow. We have behind the scene looks at upcoming guests, upcoming episodes, and some special social media only content. Subscribe to the show now. And now, let's get back to our episode. Earlier in his mandate, Jason Kenney took a gamble on the Keystone XL pipeline to get it built down to Texas or to New Orleans, one or the other. I apologize. My mind's a little foggy right now. Um, but it didn't pay off. President Biden vetoed it. And now we have invested money. The Alberta people have invested money in a pipeline that's literally going nowhere right now. When it comes to the oil and gas sector, what is the position of the Alberta party? And how do we get off the boom and bust cycle that has ha that we have been so reliant on for the last hundred years? <laughs> so, so on the re for the resource sector itself, yeah, we have to rem we have to remember and not be so arrogant. To understand that there's things that we can't control. The world price of oil and natural gas are beyond our control. We just aren't big enough players. I mean, we're great player, and we're great players. We're just not big enough. And so there's some things that aren't in our control. So now we have to move back and shift to look after things we can look after. And again, it's like every other problem solving. We don't. We shouldn't start with a statement. We should start with what we want to accomplish. And then we bring in people who are extremely talented and extremely smart and know how to take us there. I do not purport to be the smartest person in any room. I think um, my leadership skills though, to bring people together and to facilitate solutions, I think I'm pretty darn good at that. But you know, when it comes to an energy transition and actually defining what the ener energy industry should look like in Alberta, I would love us to be the best we can be. I would love us to be net zero by 2050. But I don't have the expertise personally to be able to impose those solutions. So yeah, I, I wouldn't be advising on to invest a billion dollars in one thing or another. I'd be gathering those great minds that have built an amazing industry in this province, have built the cleanest injury in, uh, sorry, industry in the world when it comes to fossil fuels and challenge them and say, what are we gonna to do to make it better? And you know what, I've met people in the last few days who have the ability to do it. They just need the government to give them some consistency, knowing that their investments are gonna be worthwhile uh, and the people will come up with a solution. They just do it time after time. Um, government has to get out of the way a bit and, and let, let the right people do the right job. I, I really firmly believe that. You talk about your leadership style, and I want to dig a little bit deeper into that. Often we hear reports from either Ottawa or Edmonton saying that the premier or the prime minister are very hands-on, very in the weeds with the ministers, in the weeds of certain issues, in the weeds of all files. How would you approach your leadership in that position if you were to be elected premier in the next uh, provincial election how would you go about leading this province through 
the recovery of a pandemic, the recovery of the oil and gas industry, the recovery from agriculture industry that has been hampered because of climate change in the last this last season. I hear reports all the time that farmers had a bad season this year. How would you move forward and what is your leadership style that would help Albertans? Well, you can ask anybody that's worked with me, first of all, <laughs> in the weeds and detail, like the fine detail, that is not my strength. I, I, you know, I admit that. Uh, that's not my thing. And I've got, um, I've always been blessed, and I'll certainly in the last parts of my career here municipally, to have people who filled in those gaps for me, right? Had a great staff at AUMA, had a great staff at the City of Brooks, had people on my council who were more into this or more interested in that. And that's what you have to do. I, I am not afraid of someone being smarter than me, as I said before, because that's what I need. I need all the smartest and hardworking Albertans to be part of this solution. And so my style is to, you know, work through this province to understand what communities need to move forward and then reach out to people who can deliver it. I can deliver. I can't do everything. And, and no elected official uh, can. No single party in my mind can. This is a province-wide issue. And we have to gather up the best and the brightest. You know, who's to say, for instance, that an opposition uh, member of the legislature isn't the best suited to chair a committee or, or lead, a, a, lead a, a task force? We, sh we shouldn't preclude that. We should be taking the best and the brightest, putting them in their places, and empowering them to, to, to make Alberta better. There's nothing wrong in my mind uh, with reaching out past a, my normal circle, for instance. I mean, I have people I trust, right, that, that look me in the eye and tell me when I'm goofing up or when, when I'm not doing right, and I trust those people to do that. But I also know that there is a world of, uh, of um, information and experience uh, out there that we need to tap into, and I'm inviting all Albertans to contribute to that. That's the way we're going to get out of this. I want to talk about communities here for a second because it's, it's always weird to talk to someone who's now a provincial leader who literally led a community over the last four years. Um, as I said previously, I'm, I worked in a municipality. I, I know that the, this last few years, even in the NDP and in the UCP, things have gotten tough for communities. MSI, MSI funding has been yeah. fiddled with. Um, downloading of services to municipalities have happened. How do you work with your municipality brothers and sisters? How do you work with the leaders of the municipalities when over the last four years, everything seems to be just thrown at the dartboard board and hopefully something will hit with municipalities when it comes to their relationships? Well, you know what I would do, <laughs> first of all, is that, uh, first of all, I know the resource that exists in municipal government, um, all, and not just municipal government, but local people. But when we talk about municipal government specifically, as you know, president of the AUMA, I've toured uh, all but about seven of my members over four years, been in all of those communities, and I can tell you what a tremendous waste we have uh, the provincial government's not leveraging and taking advantage of that incredible amount of resource. From the biggest city so of Calgary and Edmonton down to the smallest villages, we all are committed to building. And the fact is, is that we don't have a good division of powers. We don't have consistent and proper funding. It is not so much that we, uh, and, and we're kind of reduced in a way, the way the province treats us, like children. Like, you know, here's your money, go home. Uh, when we have great ideas about how to do better in policing, how to do better when it comes to distribution of funds. Um, you know, I, I can give you a really solid example of this. So when the most funding came out, which was the municipal uh, uh, kind of funding the province, and we were grateful that they gave us that money to help everybody through the revenue problem we had through COVID. Well, we have a lot of small members, right? Um, in terms of numbers, most of our members are small. And they don't have a lot of administrative horsepower. So AUMA and me as president asked the minister at the time, said, can we not have them have to file a report, apply for the money, and then file another report to at the end? Because it's a very small amount of money, and they have limited administrative capacity. You talk about reducing red tape and, and costs, 
This is one way to do it, right? They refused. So the smallest village in the in the summer fall smallest summer villages, and I know I've been to summer villages where they have like fifty permanent residents, had to do all the same paperwork that Edmonton had to do for their money. Now you tell me how does that work? Those are the things we need to tap into and be aware that there are differences. The other thing that I think is tremendous that we don't take advantage of as well is that there's capacity and efficiency in driving authority and resources down, down to the community level. And I think one of the first things we have to do is recognize the significance, imp sorry, significant importance of municipalities and we have to bake that into Alberta's um, business plan going forward. And I'm really excited about discussing that as our policy starts to take shape over the next six months. It just, uh, we are recording this the last week of October. This is coming out November 10th, but it was just, it was just announced earlier, I think last week, if not this weekend, RCMP costs are going up. Yeah. There is a backlog of pay raises, and this is going to cause communities like Brooks, mm -hmm. like like X, Y, and Z communities, Huge. a big financial strain. Yeah. The current premier has floated the idea of a Alberta police force. I look at this, and this is I'm going to ask the question here in a few seconds. But I look at this and I say, the Alberta police force would be even more money more resources because you're not getting federal funding that you get when you have the RCMP. What is your position on how municipalities have to deal with this, but what the provincial government should be doing potentially around a Alberta police force? Okay, so <laughs> unpacking policing is a good one. I, I, I yeah. just, I had to write it down yeah, because no, this literally right. it came at the top of my head. Because you're like, absolutely right. Significant costs. Five years of back pay. Uh, RCMP were on the lowest paid forces in the country. Um, you know, with this retroactive pay increases, they're going to be, you know, top eights. They're going to be where they need to be. And uh, I don't know of anybody, um, and certainly not my community, that would deny that, you know, the ability to pick up your phone and call your RCMP and have them deal with things is good. There's a couple of things that we need to remember. One, overwhelmingly, Albertans are satisfied with, with the RCMP. Overwhelmingly. Uh, you're right to point out that there's a federal grant and federal support that's not calculable in dollars yeah. because of just the sheer magnitude of what the RCMP can do. Uh, and then third, there is a significant improvement over the last four years to the RCMP's commitment to be community policemen and community police force. So as it is in practicality is that my staff sergeant in Brooks is my police chief. He is responsible for policing my community, the community of Brooks. And he does so for a pretty reasonable dollar, um, even though it's a significant part of my budget. You know, it's a, a quarter of the budget right now, and it's about to go up. And uh, the idea that the Fair Deal panel, number 13 out of 15 recommendations, said we should look at a pol provincial police force. Um, in no way, shape, or form reflected what was going on. I went to several of those. I know my communities. I can tell you there weren't a lot of them talking about a, a new provincial police force. When you take all of that into account, it puts us right back to a, kind of the very beginning of our discussion. Why are we where we are? Because provincial governments, and it doesn't matter whether it's this one or the last one, need to listen to people at the community level. The fact is, is that, yes, do we need to improve? There is nothing we don't need to improve. It doesn't matter whether it's health care, education, policing, or whatever. But no one said throw it away. Not one person that I know said throw it away. And the fact remains that we need to incrementally improve policing. It started with a political statement that rural crime was a problem. Yes, it is a problem. Crime is a problem. But there are other ways of tackling it. A provincial police force we know is going to cost more money. Um, if any of the any of the conversions are any indication, uh, you know Surrey being one, uh, they were supposed to be done their changeover from RCMP to being a, a city police force two and a half years ago. I think now it's there's cost overruns. They can't recruit people. Um, the report that was done by uh, 
I'm not, was it KPMG? I'm not sure who was the, no, it wasn't them. It was another consulting company that did a report. The minister committed to, to releasing it, still not out. Why are we out? They've, my understanding is they've commissioned other ones. They spent two and a half million dollars for something Albertans don't want. And now they're talking about they've spent some more money on doing more studies. The fact is we have pressing problems, community problems. Come out to see us in the communities, talk to us, and we'll direct your resources in the right way. Provincial police force, uh, no. It's a total waste, miss, just a waste of priority right now. We've got other things wrong. Speaking of reports, another report was released actually last week, which was the long-awaited Allen report about the foreign funding of oil uh, in groups uh, against the oil and gas sector. Uh, have you read it? I haven't read it. No, I've read about it, and I haven't read it. It's 600 pages. So yeah. I'm not sure that given what's gone on about it that I'm going to spend that much time on it. Um, yeah, so I won't talk about it too much, but I'll ask this one question. Um, you talk about report after report after report, commissioning all this money to do all these reports. Have we been wasting money? Are reports actually needed? Because you, you come from a political background. You work in a municipality. If you say to your director of engineering or director of community services, I need to report on X, Y, and Z, they're going to come back, and it's not going to cost two million dollars to do a report. It's going to cost like twenty thousand. Like I just, I find that we're throwing money at reports for no apparent reason, and they're not coming out with the results that people want. Yeah. Well, I, I think again, it's uh, why are you doing it? Yeah. So you make a statement, and then you put something in place. You know, uh, foreign funding is causing a problem in Alberta's energy industry. And I, you know, I, I, I know protests are disruptive, right? They, they create disruption. But we also know that we're free to protest. Um, and I can't speak directly to how much of an influence, because that's a bit convoluted in the, in the things that I've read about how much influence they had over projects and such. But the problem really with the whole study report is that you commission the report to back up a political statement that really didn't solve a problem. Right? Yeah. Uh, and then the report gets built to work through your political statement. And, you know, if you watch what happens with a lot of reports, you know, there's a lot of fanfare when it comes out, and then there it comes out of the balloon and it sits there kind of crumpled up on the floor. So I'd like to see us change that too, because uh, again, we're asking the wrong people to solve problems for us. And I, uh, I just, I don't think a re Reports have their place, you know, you want to understand issues and things, but we shouldn't be doing a report to, to support statements. We should be building reports and doing that kind of work to actually enable something to happen. And I don't, you know, from what I've read and what I see, the recommendations uh, don't really allow us to step off and move forward. So, I just want to just mention one thing. I agree. You have the right to protest. You do not, though, and this is Chris Brown talking, this is not the leader of the Alberta Party, I want to make sure that's on record, but you do not have the right to protest outside of a hospital. Stop you, it. We came out strong against that, and we, uh, again, happened too late. We should have been out there early. Yeah. Um, the last area I want to talk about before we wrap up here, Barry, is our First Nations communities, sure. our Indigenous communities. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We are in a troubling time. We are finding grave sites at former residential schools here in Alberta, across Canada. How, do you, how would you approach building a better relationship with our First Nations communities, the people of this land? So that's a very big question. So... Um you know, um, we all have to take our steps from where we're standing. And I think a lot, of, a lot of us are behind. A lot of institutions, a lot of governance, a lot of government agencies are way behind in this conversation. So I think, first of all, we have to educate ourselves without preconceived notions. We've got to drop all that stuff because, again, this comes down to people. And that's how I think we need to approach it. So I've really made a concerted effort. I've... I've had a really good conversation with the leadership at a, at a Métis uh, settlement in northern Alberta. I just a few weeks ago was at the Eden Valley Reserve and got to talk to a, a, an elder there and, and just listen to what's going on and 
one of the things I think that we need to be very cognizant of is the uniqueness of all of those conversations. And I don't want to draw parallels too closely because, you know, sometimes people can think I'm minimizing the problem. and That's not my point here. My point here is that four and a half million Albertans, you and I, we're two Albertans. We've lived here a long time. We love this place. I love this province. You love this province. You're here. Um, but we have unique takes on it. We, our solutions for our lives are different. And there's got to be recognition of that, also with First Nations, that we have to recognize there are unique issues. And rather than try and uh, impose one solution on everyone, or try to not, and, and so we don't do anything because we can't get agreement. You know, if, it, if I had my, my wherewithal today, I would be going out and, and making those customized solutions. And I it, tell you one that struck me very clearly with Eden Valley. And I, and I don't know all of the background, but I'll just tell you what it looks like to me. So I was there in the afternoon, four o'clock rolls around, and uh, Keith's wife has to say, hey, excuse me, I've got to leave. We were in the teepee kind of sharing stories. They were sharing stories or asking questions. Had to go pick up her daughter, who goes to school at the public school in the town close by. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So, it, you know, oh, well, the bus only comes just inside the, the reserve, drops them off, you have to pick them up. And I just thought to myself, you know, we talk about, you know, equity and access and opportunity. On a ranch across the highway from where we were, that bus would have taken that 13-year-old girl right to the yard. Now, I don't know why they weren't coming right to Keith's yard, but that speaks to some of these issues that we have to take on. And they're, they're, they're small issues that need to be solved one at a time as quickly as we can by empowerment, by allowing these local solutions to build up to advantage people that live in those communities. And I think my approach, again, would be you have to go out there and pay attention, customize, be have different solutions for different groups because the fact is is that at the end of the day like I said before every decision every policy every move you make should lift up an entire community there should be no one who gets disadvantaged by what you do and I still think one of our biggest problems with our First Nations and Indigenous communities is that our policies disadvantage them in one way or another I don't purport to understand all of the historical issues but I do know that if there are solutions for non-Indigenous for that issue, then there've got to be solutions for Indigenous in that issue as well. Thank you for that. Um, we are at the 45-minute mark. I, I want to ask this last question. We have two, almost a year and a half, two years until the next election. 2023 is when it's supposed to be called or should be called as uh, fixed election dates. Um you have a lot of traveling to do, but you're not going to meet all 4 million Albertans. No, I, I wish I could, because exactly. I'm pretty sure if I did, I could win for sure, uh, but they can't do that. Really. So my question is, how can people get in touch? How can people get involved with the Alberta Party? All right, so um, you can always email me, leader at albertaparty.ca, and I've made this commitment to everybody I've talked to. Where two or more are gathered, and you want to just talk about the Alberta Party, you want to talk about Alberta, and you want to talk to me about solutions to our issues, I, I will do everything I can to be there. And we're just going to move like that. And hopefully those two people will talk to two more. I was with a group of 14 people in the city of Calgary here last week, and uh, I, 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 you know, great conversation they have lots of good ideas lots of issues but one of the questions they kept asking was well how do we change it how do we change it and i said it's up to all of us to change it we all have to take a stand and say it's time to do uh governance better great government by the way not a sexy thing hard to sell but you know what a government you don't hear from for months is probably the best one you're going to have and uh, i think that exists out there i think people want it and I'm going to work my hardest to make sure they know the Alberta Party uh, can do it. So email, call, text, social media, however you want to get in touch with us, we will work our tails off to get to see you. I, I can't believe I actually forgot this question. 
I should have asked this at the beginning of the when I, we were talking about seats in the legislature. There's an upcoming by-election to be determined when that's going to be called. Can we see your name on the ballot in Fort McMurray Cold Lake? No, you won't see my name on the ballot in Fort McMurray Cold Lake. And I think, you know, in fairness to me, to no, fairness to everybody, let's, let's put it this way. I, uh, I'm not prepared to move that far away from my home right now. Um, and I, if, if I run in a by-election, I'm going to live where I run. I, I'm going to be committed to that community. So Has the search started for a candidate? Absolutely, yeah. In fact, I'm going to be uh, leaving uh, right after our AGM uh, and doing a northeast tour through that whole riding uh, and culminating in uh, Fort McMurray. I hope to be able to spend uh, Remembrance Day in Fort McMurray. And along the way, we're going to talk to some, we've already had reach outs to people who could be potential candidates. Um, again, committed community people who want to see uh, their community uh, strive to be better. And uh, hopefully, I'm very certain we're going to get a great community-based candidate. Speaking of Remembrance Day, this is airing November 10th. So tomorrow morning, we are off. We do not have an episode in honor of Remembrance Day. Do you have a message you want to give to the people of Alberta about Remembrance Day? Yeah, you, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting because um, everyone has, everyone changes. Uh, everyone I experience changes. Um, you hear personal stories of sacrifice and commitment. And, uh, and it, it, it happens in a modern time too, whether we've had refugees and people that have fought in wars all over. Um, but, you know, this country was built on a foundational commitment to serve each other. And Remembrance Day always reminds me of what I've done pales in comparison to what others have done. And I just always imagine um, kind of the utopia that Alberta would be is if we all did a little bit more service, if we all were kinder, if we all were a little more considerate, and we thought about all of the situations that veterans have been in the past to keep us free, to allow us to have the amazing lifestyle we have. And if we just all stepped up a little bit more, just like they did, uh, I just think Alberta would be in great shape. So I always think about the future uh, and Remembrance Day, even though we're, we're remembering, but I always think about the potential future. If we could just take that feeling and that attitude and, and move this province forward. Barry, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'm glad we were able to meet and connect and chat. And I hope my listeners have and my viewers have gathered something out of this because people like yourself are doing it for the right reason. You seem like a very straightforward, straight-shooting guy, and I think we need more of that in politics. Um, like I said previously, we are off tomorrow uh, in observance of Remembrance Day. But I ask this to my listeners and to my viewers. Go out to your local legion. Get out to your cenotaphs. Remember those who have fought and served this country. And remember those who are fighting and serving for this country as well. Because we have men and women across this world right now who are in the Canadian military uniform. And we need to honor their sacrifices and their family sacrifices. Um, Barry, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. And best of luck with you as things move forward. Thank you.